Good morning. Really appreciate you guys coming out. Uh, a lot of stuff has changed with Microsoft recently. A lot of new stuff is coming out. We want to take the time after uh, post Ignite, Microsoft Ignite that took place a couple weeks ago in Chicago and spend some time letting you guys know what's new, what's coming, what's changing. Um, so for those of you that haven't met me, I think I know at least half the room. <clears throat> uh, I'm Rob Husted with Sirium Networks. Uh, Sirium is a Microsoft partner local here. We're headquartered in Spokane. I'm just down the street. Um, I've been working with the LCS, OCS, Link, now Skype for Business product for about eight years, and I love it when they rebrand it. I just love it because I get to re-educate people that the product hasn't gone away and that it's still out there. Microsoft just put some new stickers on it, new colors. Okay, So we're going to spend some time today talking about that, and of course already I'm not in the camera. So I'm going to come back to the camera because this is where all the magic happens. Um, so. Let's get going. Uh, please feel free to ask questions throughout this. I like this to be dynamic. A lot of you guys use, have used Link in the past or you know, are currently using Link for various different reasons. Some of you have replaced your, your entire PBX. Some of you are working down that path. So comments, questions, anything we can do to learn from each other is absolutely fantastic. Um, but if I end up being the only one talking, that's OK too. All right, so we're here to talk about Skype for Business. And I have the wrong logo up there, so let's get rid of the Link logo because Link is gone. It's now Skype for Business. And let's talk a little bit about, about what's going on. So here's, here's what we're going to do today. Um, I have you until uh, noon on the calendar. I don't think I have three hours of material. I think about 11.30 you probably wrap up. Okay. Um, I'm going to do this in a couple different sections. I want to talk about Microsoft's vision and why they're rebranding Link to Skype and what, what happened and what that actually means to all of you that are using the product or some of you that are maybe considering using the product. Um, so we'll talk about what's, what's new in the latest release, why it's rebranded. We'll do a demonstration of the user interface and talk about the differences between the Link UI and the Skype UI. And I think that'll be about a good time for a break. You guys can stretch your legs for a minute and get, get some refreshed coffee and stuff. Um, then I want to go into a, a follow-up discussion on a lot more new features, roadmap stuff that's coming later this year, and the flexible deployment options. Because with Microsoft, it's definitely a cloud-first, mobile-first world. But their previous mantra of cloud on your terms is still very much reality. And so I want to talk about how you can deploy this as a premise-based solution, as a cloud solution, or a hybrid, hybrid solution. Then uh, we'll have another break, and we have a, another presenter that's going to come in and talk about taking uh, Skype for Business voice to the next level and talk about intelligent, cloud, uh, intelligent call routing. And that's going to be based off of an inch house product. Um, and then that'll pretty much get us to the end. I want to talk a little bit about readiness, monitoring some of the new tools that have come out to be able to monitor your environment. And then we'll, we'll wrap up. Got a few things to give away. We'll get you on your way. OK? Questions? Is anybody in the wrong room? OK, so I assume most of you guys have heard of the term unified communications. And if you've been watching Microsoft's, <clears throat> Microsoft's webinars that they've been doing and their new discussions, especially at Ignite, um, did anybody go to Ignite by any chance? OK, I've got a good shot at giving you guys a bunch of new material. This is great. So the, the vision at Microsoft is now really universal communications. And that's part of why the, the rebrand is taking place. So over the past three to six years, um, unified communications with Link has been, uh, you know, truly in, in full effect. It's been, you know, regarded as the leading or one of the leading UC clients in the market. And the goal of that client was to bridge audio conferencing, video conferencing, web conferencing, instant messaging, telephony, and voicemail all into one user experience. And, you know, Microsoft felt that that goal of unified communications really was pretty well taken care of within Link. And so now the, uh, the vision is to go into more of a universal communication. So going beyond what Link can do, um, being able to interact on any, any device, anywhere you're at with anyone out in the world, and hence, hence the Skype nomenclature, right? So we really want to bridge the gap between the consumer world and the business world and, and tie these together extremely well. Um, so to do that, one of their goals is to create a familiar experience across those devices. And a lot of this is, is really super geared towards the millennials. You know, as we get towards 2020, the, 
the people in the industry, in, in the uh, people working in the industries, are going to be largely from that millennial generation, which I, I just missed by like about five, ten years, um, and so they grew up with a very different type of experience, right? So when my kids were born, the internet was already in existence; it was in full effect. When I was born, there was no internet. Um, I'm kind of in between. A couple generations, I don't really fit with the Gen X, I don't really fit with the Millennials. Um, I grew up with an Apple II Plus at my house. I got to play Oregon, Oregon Trail a lot, so I was the Oregon Trail generation. Um, there's actually an article out that on, on the internet if you go look for that. The Oregon Trail generation. So any of you out there get excited when you die of dysentery? I, I, I love it. That was great. Okay. So Microsoft is understanding that over the next five years, there's a, going to be a major shift in the way the workforce is expecting to collaborate because all these people that grew up with the internet are coming in and they're going to expect to communicate in a different way. So how do we make that seamless for them? Okay. Familiar experience when they come from home into the office. Make sure they don't have better ways to communicate at home than they do in the office. Um, across all the devices, you know, bring, bring your own device is still very, very popular um, and being able to have that global reach through the cloud. Okay. That is universal communications. I do want to keep in mind that we are part of a much bigger conversation. We're going to talk about Skype for Business today, but if you continue to go out and look at various Ignite videos, of which I have some recommendations for which ones to go watch, um, you'll find out quickly that Skype is really just a part of a larger story. Um, I don't know if, how many of you have heard of Office Graph, but that's Microsoft's machine learning engine that Delve from SharePoint has been built upon. And everything is going to be very, very context aware. So your communication platform, which so far today has just been content, is going to switch into a, more of a people, groups, and organization standpoint. So take your, your SharePoint environment that's powering your document collaboration, uh, it's powering your, um, your news feeds, it's a way for teams to get together and collaborate you know, on, on, on various projects they're working on. Well, Microsoft is going to make this a much more dynamic environment to where you can find groups of people that work together and quickly build them into a team and then layer in communications on top of that so that uh, very, very quickly you can go from getting an email to enhancing that with a Yammer feed to building a uh, video conference on top of it and being able to truly collaborate. So Skype is a very powerful tool, but it is just part of a larger story. Welcome to the front row. Thanks. <laughs> I like going up. Not a problem. No, we're glad you made it. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Okay. So, Skype for Business, part of a bigger story. But we're going to focus on Skype for Business today. So, I don't think I need this, I can get this out of my face. Um, so let's talk about what's new. And the biggest thing that changed is the client user interface. And a lot of you probably have already played with it. Um, so let's dig in a little bit deeper into what that user interface looks like. So first of all, what is Skype for Business? Where did Link go? And Link didn't go away. So what I want, it to, be, what I want to be very clear about is that this is not the consumer product. When we talk about Skype for Business, they did not get rid of Link and replace it with Skype. And that was really a really common misconception when they first brought it out. That Link was, Link was done, they, they, they uh, made it end of life and they just brought in Skype. That's not what it is. It's, it's still Link with a new look and feel. Okay? So there's still two separate services. So when you sign into Skype at home in the consumer product, that is a different service than what is being delivered as Skype for Business. And again, it's, it's geared toward the millennials. They're building for the future. Um, the intention here is, again, similar experience, right? So people want to come from their home environment, go to work, and already know how to use the tools. Or at least Microsoft is hoping that that's what they're able to deliver to you. Is you, you, you get a new job, you come into the office, and your communication platform is very familiar to you from what you used at home. Okay. Um, Really the goal with this product, and I hope this, this is what you, you start to leave here with, is that they're trying to get the technology out of the way and just make the client very, very intuitive. And you know, they, they say when, in their studies that they've done that when they poll people, 86% of the people that are polled prefer the new Skype user interface over the Link user interface. Um, 
I've been using it for, for a number of weeks. I really do prefer it. I think I, I put it in, on in my computer in mid-April, and I, I do think it is a better interface. And I'll show you some things uh, today specifically as to why I think it's a better interface. So, okay, moral of the story. Link didn't go away. This is just a rebrand of the product, new colors, new logos. The client was pushed out via an office update. So this is very different from what they've done in the past. When we went from LCS 2003 to 2005 to OCS 07 to R2 to Link 2010 to Link 2013, every time it was a new uh, client install. And that meant a big, a big push, a big, you know, IT had to really prepare to get this new client out. How are we gonna do it? We're gonna push it out, we're gonna, or are we not gonna push it out, or are we gonna use the old client? This time around, it's just an office update. And so I imagine most of you guys have already dealt with this to some degree. The office update has come down, you've chosen to deploy it, you've chosen not to deploy it, uh, end users may have deployed it on their own. Um, so we had a couple weeks of a little bit of confusion there as well as to how to, how to deal with that. So, so we'll talk a bit more about that in detail. But anyway, new client UI, not a new client install, it's based on an update. There's also a new premise server release. So the premise-based server is Skype for Business Server 2015. And if you go out on TechNet and you start looking for it, that's what you'll see, Skype for Business Server 2015. There are, of course, new features that come along with this service. Some of them are coming later. Some of them are there now. Um, and they've also updated the Office 365 service. So again, you can consume this as a cloud service or a premise-based service. Any questions? No? Okay. Let's talk about how we pick our UI, because you can use both. So we're gonna, let's, let's dig into this for a little bit. Um, as a Link 2010 or a Link 2013 customer, you can use the Skype for Business user interface now. You can also use the older interfaces. They're very good now about backward compatibility and forward compatibility. So as a Link 2013 customer, you could be using the Link 2010 client, or you could be using the Skype for Business client. Um, you get to pick your UI, but the thing is with this Office update that came out, it it's really is the latest version of the Skype client. Um, they've just changed, they've given you the option of having two different user interfaces. But there are things that are still changed in the background. And one of the big ones is the ringtones and the sounds. All those Skype sounds that they've included in the new user interface are still there if you stick with the link user interface. So that's something for your end users to be aware of, um, or at least your help desk to be aware of when their end users call and say, hey, I lost all of my link sounds, what happened? Um, so that's an adjustment that's gonna need to be, be, uh, be part of that. Also, there's icons that get changed. So there's places where you're gonna run the link, link user interface, but it still references Skype for Business in different places. Um, if you don't want any of the new changes, if you want the real Link 2013 experience, you, you can't upgrade Link. And that doesn't work forever. Eventually, you're gonna need to start patching your software. But this is the KB article here, the um, 288.9923 that came out that really started to change things. So if you don't apply this, or if you haven't applied this, you haven't seen any sort of change yet. When you apply this change, your users are gonna be presented with one of two options, and it kind of depends on how you've configured the server, and I'll talk about that. But these two boxes here actually showcase what happens for the user. Um, if you have decided that your users are going to stay with the link user interface, they're gonna be presented with this box that says you have the newer version of link, but your I, it's called Skype for Business, but your IT department would like you to use the link, so restart back into the link user interface. Um, if you have the toggle set to use the Skype UI, it's going to give you the second box that says, you guys are updating to Skype for Business. Go ahead and enjoy all your new features. And there are, there are very specific controls we can put to make this happen. So that's what we'll talk about next. So if your server is patched to the latest level, you have a new attribute available to you as a shell command. And the set CS client policy Enable Skype UI will allow you globally to control whether you'll use the Skype user interface or the link user interface. So if you're not ready for your users to go through that change, maybe you're, there's a lot of reasons you may not want to. Maybe you're still mid-install uh, mid, uh, of Link 2013 because we've got customers that are still deploying Link 2013 right now. Maybe it wasn't the right time to interrupt that. You've already got half your company using it. You don't want, you don't want to split that. 
Um, if you set this to false, then it won't enable the Skype UI. And on a glo global level, everybody will be using the link UI. If you set it to true, at a global level, everybody will use the Skype UI. It depends on where you're at in your journey. The big thing here is you can, you, there, I do recommend that you go to the Skype UI eventually. And there's going to be a point where you'll want to educate your users and say, we're going to make a change to the user interface. Maybe here's some quick reference guides, some things to expect. And then you'll toggle this over. And at their next reboot, essentially, their next restart of their client, they'll get the new user interface. There was a way to do this with the registry key. And I just put in this in here for your, for your reference. I don't recommend that you use this method. This is a lot of uh, effort on your part. But before the uh, link shells came out, or if you uh, don't have the, your server updated uh, to the latest level, you could play around with it using the registry key. I did not pay Lance to say that. That was the perfect segue. OK. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so uh, Serium Networks has a very mixed environment. right? We run Link as a PBX. We run Avaya and Cisco because we work with multiple manufacturers. We have very, very good reasons to not just go every, put everybody onto the Skype UI. So we needed a way to be able to control who got the new user interface and who stayed on the link user interface. So we did that by building user level client policies instead of applying the global. So what we did is we, we did say the global preference at Serium is the link UI. And then we built client policies to toggle that back and forth. So now anybody that is a link enterprise voice user, you know, roughly about half of our company, uh, we can go ahead and put them on the Skype UI and they can start using these right away. People that maybe have different levels of integration to link um, RCC, you know, remote call control type integrations, client plugins, things that weren't quite ready for that new user interface, we can leave them on the link UI. So you can have a mixed environment if it makes sense. Just keep in mind from an IT support perspective, you know, can your help desk handle that? Is that, what's, is that the best interest of your organization? But definitely when you're testing it out, you can build it this way and then IT can get it early and then you guys can get a handle on it ahead of time before you roll it out to your users. So you do that with the management shell. Uh, new CS client policy, uh, you can just give it an identity and set the attribute like you would any client policies. And then what happens is it's automatically going to show up as an option in your client policy within your control panel. And you just go into the user and, and set it. I'm actually going to do that as part of my demo. Okay. For reference, I'll, I'll send this deck out to you guys so you can have a copy of it because I have a lot of links in here I want you guys to walk away with. Just for your reference, if you wanted to know what your server needed to be patched at or what, um, what happens at different versions and patches for the user interface, this is here for you. Essentially, Link 2010, the February cumulative update, if you've applied this, you should have the features, uh, the attribute to be able to do that. Um, so Nelson, maybe we need to check to see if that's actually the case. Because this is what the TechNet documentation says. I don't have a Lab 2010 environment to check on anymore. But that would be, you know, if this is applied, you should be able to go in and set that global client policy. For Link 2013, it, it was that update in December that came out that enabled that, that property so that we could set that. And then over here in this table, here's what is going to happen at various levels, what's, what the client is going to be preferred. The intention was if, if you were on 2013 or 2010 and your server wasn't patched, your users weren't going to be forced into the new user interface. That, that was the intention. If you are on the Skype for Business backend, it's going to prefer the Skype UI. And all of this is from a premise perspective, right? We, this isn't this is a cloud, cloud discussion because Microsoft is pushing the Skype UI in 365 pretty hard. Questions? Does that all make sense? Lyle? Well, it's not really part of uh, Microsoft's push for that because they have it in the morning, just like that. Everybody has their Skype on. So you, you guys ended up with the Skype UI? Yeah. So you were, do you know what scenario that puts you in? Because you know, according to the tables and things, that's not supposed to happen. Skype that they did that whole 
Okay. Okay. So they ended up in the link UI, but it was that was the biggest challenge. Was even though they put out some some alerts and some webinars, you know, the entire community didn't know, and I I didn't I would have liked a bit more knowledge because I would have liked to send out that alert to you guys. We figured it out pretty much the same day <clears throat> that you figured it out. And then yeah, you had some some disruptance. Yeah, that's a very different approach. They've not done that before, so maybe they learned. All right, so now that I've talked about the backend processes for controlling it, and we talked a little bit about the UI, let's go into a, a demonstration of the user interface and toggling back and forth so you can under, uh, try and understand some of the new features that are there, why you might want to go in and look at the new client. So I'm going to jump out of this really quickly in the slideshow, and I will Switch to a duplication so you guys can see my screen. Perfect. Okay, so this is the Link 2013 client that we have known and loved for three years. And I have recently applied the patch to my PC, and so I've, uh, I would have seen the box that came up and said, uh, you've got the new Skype client, but your company prefers that you use Link, so restart, and now you're at the Link client side. Um, this is our control panel for the, it's still the Link Server 2013 control panel, so I'm rep trying to represent, you know, close to what you guys are having there. And if I search for myself, I can find myself in the list. And when I scroll down to the client policy, we have a few different client policies in play. Again, the automatic client policy is the global one. And Sirium has made the global one the Link 2013 user interface. So I'm going to choose the Skype UI because that's the one that's most relevant to me. And then I'll commit. And now I give that, you know, 30 seconds, 60 seconds just to make sure it's applied in the back end. Um, through in-band provisioning, when I restart my, my Link client, it's going to check for that flag on the back end of the server when it goes to sign in. If it sees that flag that enables Skype UI, then it's going to change my interface. Lance. Is, is, is that flag on uh, the user account, or is it, does it actually go to the link server to grab that flag? Like, what, what I'm getting at is replication. If you're in a site where it's not the primary UC, where the, the, um, the link server is in a different um, site, do you have to wait for replication before you can start your account with that flag? On? OK. I think I know what you're asking. So it's, <clears throat> it's setting the attribute in the link server. So when the user logs in, it's going to be checking with the serv its registrar server. Sure. And it's going to get in-band provisioning from there. So it shouldn't take that long. I found it, it takes um, less than a minute for, me to actually, for that to actually get replicated into the topology. So it's going to get into the, the CS topology environment, not replicated through your domain controllers. Yeah. I, just, I know there's some attributes that aren't user. Right. It's, oh, it's not in the AD, like the user AD property. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and fire this back up. That should have been plenty of time. So here's my, your organization is updating to a new version of Link. Restart to enjoy all of the improvements and benefits and rights and everything. It's awesome. Okay, so I'll restart now. And now it comes immediately back up with the Skype user interface. So that's how you would do it on a user, user setting, right? If you're again, if you're looking for, I want you know a group of people to become power users who want to really understand what the new features are. Maybe we want to build some quick reference sheets or point people some, to some tutorials. We can figure it out before we just push it out to everybody. And then you could send out an email saying we're going to do this over the weekend. When you come back on Monday, expect to see this type of a change. Okay. So now we're in the new user interface. So let's talk about what they've done here. Um, visually, you can tell that it, there's some differences. There's some different colors. There's some different graphics. The pictures have gone from squares to circles. But for the most part, it's laid out very similarly to the Link 2013 interface. So if this did happen to an individual um, and they weren't expecting it, they wouldn't get too lost. 
Come on in, guys. I saved you a seat right up front, Art. <laughs> There's a couple over there, too, if you don't want to be too close to me. It's, I won't take offense. <laughs> okay, so the new user interface. Um, Skype colors, Skype sounds, Skype graphics, but still laid out the way you would expect it. When I hover over uh, one of my contacts, the communication bar comes out. I can still hover over and I can get to my IM. I can make an audio call. I can make a video call. I can see the contact card. And you notice the, the contact card didn't change because this, this is a function of Office. So I'm running Office 2013. This is the Office 2013 contact card. And that maintains the, the, uh, the older look and feel. This will likely get refreshed with Office 2016. So the, the ways you communicate are very much the same. Users shouldn't be too lost here. Um, from a status standpoint and relationships, these, the, you know, the organization is still here. Adding in new, new individuals into your contacts is the same. Um, when you go into your persistent chat environment, you know, this, is, this is still there. It's still operating the same way. We can bring up previous conversations and work with the team here. Um, from a meeting standpoint, or, pre, or excuse me, previous conversations, they're still here. I can still go back and, and launch previous calls, jump into uh, previous instant messages, etc. And then I still have my, my dial pad with my voicemail settings here. Uh, for those of us that use this as a, as a pure voice client, uh, you know, we make phone calls out of this and we, we get our voicemail accessed from here as well. And then our meetings are still here. So I can double click to join uh, various meetings that are available. Okay. Um, if I jump into a conversation, and Phil didn't make it yet, right? Nobody saw Phil yet? Okay. Jeff, back there still? No? Chad, are you online? You sure look like you are. Chad's going to become my demo buddy for a second here. So I'm going to jump into an a instant message session with Chad. So the IM window also looks very similar. It's, it's got a lot more blue to it, but it's laid out for the most part the same. Um, however, they did make some changes, and this is where things start to get um, cha some changes for the better. Before, everything was kind of hidden behind little, little hover over buttons, and you had to hover, and again, this is the 2013 experience I'm referring to. You had to hover over things, and then pop-ups would come up, and then you had to try and get on top of the, the box to be able to get to it, to, to click into it, and sometimes it would go away, or sometimes you didn't know it was there. So what they did is they actually made you click on things instead of hover, and that, that's actually working out better. So I, can, I, I click on the video to choose to start video. I click on the phone to choose to make a phone call. I click on present to choose to present my desktop. So, hi Chad. So I've sent an instant message over to Chad. The, the instant message section has been moved into bubbles, a lot like Skype. Um, part of this, what's nice here is if I send a couple, so if I send, you know, first message, and then I send a second message, if I do that within about 60 seconds, it keeps it in the same bubble. So the organization within the instant message window is a little bit nicer. So, okay. My time, or my numbering, my counting was off. Sorry, and appreciate that, Chad. Okay, so anyway, I could go on and on. Okay, so that's an instant message, right? Um, what else has changed in this window? The, uh, the emoticons have changed. Sometimes this is really popular to some people. Um, for sometimes this is actually really uh, frustrating to some people because they liked certain icons. I know that my wife really misses the rainbow. Um, but they do, put in, they do put in some new icons. These are all animated, so we've got um, a couple different things here. That one, you're not, you're kind of feeling a little bit sick there. This guy's pretty upset. This guy's rocking out. This guy wants to punch something. So, lots of different fun emoticons. Now, these can be the animations can be turned off if you don't want the animations. You can go into your client setting. You can actually turn off the animation. Um, but these are the Skype emoticons that came over here. I like them. We use them at work quite a bit. Um, let's see. 
So hovering was removed. Um, so let's jump into a, a call now. So what I'm going to do, I have a, a meeting scheduled here at 930 that I'm going to jump into. It looks like it may have fallen off my calendar here. I think because I had it set from 9 to 930. So I'm going to go back into my Outlook calendar really quick and jump into this uh, demo meeting here. So I'll join the Skype meeting really quick. While I'm over here, what's that? Sure. While I'm on this, before I, I leave this, I just wanted to let you guys know they put out an update to Outlook to put a little disclaimer underneath the join Skype meeting. Um, for those of us that were early adopters to this and we got our new client user interface, all of a sudden our, our link meetings came out as Skype meetings and they said join Skype meeting, not join link meeting. We had a lot of people come back saying, well, I don't have a Skype account. How can I join your Skype meeting? So I would then manually go in and change my subject to link meeting and I would change my uh, hyperlink to link meeting. Microsoft decided that they would put a tagline under this to help me and let people know this is the conference bridge formerly known as link. And it literally says that right there. So that helps people understand when you send this meeting out to them this is not a actual Skype meeting. This is a link meeting. It's actually it's Skype for business. Um, also, since I happen to have this up, they brought this into, uh, into play here. This is the call monitor window. So if you think, if you remember back to the, the link days, you know, this morning before you got here, um, if you were in a link conversation and you brought up other documents in front of it, kind of lost your conversation. If this was an audio call and you wanted to mute or hang up, they would be away from you on your screen. So they brought the call monitor window over from Skype. If you guys are Skype users, this should be probably very familiar to you. So this pop-up stays in front of your window and you can move it around um, and you can close it, but you can move it around to get it out of your way, but it always keeps the, the video session or the audio session uh, really quickly at, at hand. Um, I can mute from here and I can hang up from here. This happens to be the, com the conference call that I joined by clicking on join Skype meeting. So I'll go ahead and send this update to Chad. Okay, so that's off. So what I have is I am in a meeting, a Skype for business meeting with my demo surface over here. So the video session that you're seeing um, is actually coming from that little web camera right next to the other video camera. Um, I can start my video, so again, I click, I don't have to hover anymore, and then I can start my video, which is a really flattering shot of the upward video angle, which I'm super excited about. Um, so now I've started my video, and now we can see video going on a couple sides. Chad doesn't have, maybe, maybe Chad doesn't have a webcam, he's participating audio only, and so Chad is, uh, has his photo represented in there. Um, one of the things we did with the 2013 environment when Exchange 2013 was our back end is we could use high-res photos. So you can see that was a really crisp photo of Chad. Um, and that was a nice thing we added in later on. Uh, because I can blow that up quite large and it doesn't get blurry. It's a nice sharp, sharp photo. Okay. So once we're in the session, um, some thing, you know, the feature functionality is very similar, but they've made things a little bit easier to work with. If I want to show my participants, I just have to click here. That was a little bit confusing before to, to find that. I can turn that on and off. The instant messaging is right here. I can turn that on and off, and now I can go into a full session. Again, click, don't hover. I can present. My pr presentation tools are still here. Adding attachments are still here. And then, of course, my mute controls and my hang up controls. Um, the full screen toggle is up here now, so I can pick, um, I can p go to full screen or I can pick a layout and I can switch from gallery view to speaker view, especially if I'm sharing content. So if I were to go in and share content, let's say I'll share a whiteboard. I will present more, go to a whiteboard. You can see the layout here uh, actually defaults to speaker view. It doesn't default to gallery view in this case. It's trying to give you the most real estate you can. But if you want the gallery view, it's right here for you. You can go back and forth there. Okay. So that is the that's changes to the the meeting location or the, the meeting experience. Um, could you send me a quick? I'm going to drop this, Chad. Could you send me a quick new instant message?
I'm presenting, therefore I can't receive it. Thank you. Okay, so Chad sent me a new instant message. The, the thing here to take away from is I can control where this toast pops up now. So in the previous release, it always was the lower right corner. I can go into my options and I can specify which corner I want the toast to pop up into now. So I, since I like to have my start menu over on the left, I have chosen to have my toast pop up over here. It makes more sense to me. And so to do that, you would just go into your options and you would go into, let's see here. Of course, now that I want to show it, I don't remember where it is. Automatically, contact list, status, my picture, phone, it'd be under alerts. So your position, you get those four choices for your alerts. So depending on how you want to use your, uh, your desktop, the way you've laid it out, you can have those alerts pop up wherever you want them to pop up. There's a few other, other changes in here. Um, no, the biggest one here you'll notice is Skype meetings. It used to say link meetings. Um, and you can always come back in here and you can still choose where you want to join audio for, for default or you don't have to uh, join the audio. Also, when I joined into that meeting experience, I didn't have the instant message and I didn't have the participant panel show up automatically. And if I want those to show up automatically every time, I just go in here and say I want to see I am in the participant list right away. And then I don't have to even turn them on. So if I were to come back into my meeting, now when I join, it automatically starts those for me. That's not a new feature, actually, that's been around for a while, but a lot of people didn't know about that one. Okay. Okay, I am going to place a phone call now. I'm going to show you a couple things about audio that they changed. There's a couple things in here that are, are really important and uh, maybe a good reason for people to want to actually switch the UI sooner than later. So let's just call um, information really quick. 5551212. Okay. Oh, they actually want me to talk to him. Shoot. Well, we'll just, I won't take too long. We'll just go ahead and go through the information again. What I wanted to showcase was the fact that I can't dial. One, two, one, two. Okay, this dial pad is an actual interactive dial pad. In the previous release, it was just a blue picture you couldn't interact with. If you wanted to go find your dial pad, you had to go in and dig in and find your dial pad by hovering over and bringing it up. This is actually interactive now, so I can actually click on these and uh, work with an IVR over the phone without having to go find it. So my controls are right here. That's really important. So I'll drop that because I don't want to cause them too many problems. And now I'll call Chad and I'll show you a couple different things. So let's call Chad. So we'll click on this and we'll, esc we'll escalate that to audio. I'm going to mute. Okay. <clears throat> so when I'm in here with Chad, now I'm in a, a conversation with somebody that I work with. It knows the contact. It's not going to present me with the dial pad. So what if I need a dial pad now? Or what if I want to interact with my headsets or you know, I want to change those things? There's a new button on here that you may not have seen before. And this is something I want you to be aware of is this call controls button. When you, when you click on the call controls, which is, which is the telephone with the settings wheel, now here's your dial pad to interact with. Here's your hold button. Here's your transfer button. And here are your devices. This transfer button was a pretty sticky thing for, for end users in 2013. That was something that people potentially uh, preferred in 2010 over 2013 was the, the transfer experience was easier in 2010. In 2013, they've presented it more immediately. So the previous call where I called information, it was just right there in the dial pad. You didn't have to go find it. If it's somebody in your organization, you do need to click on this, but then if I wanted to transfer this, I can hit transfer. Now I can transfer it to my mobile phone or I could transfer it to my house or I could search for Jeff Lynch and I could find Jeff here and then I can send it off to Jeff. Yeah. 
Can you? I see. Um, I haven't seen a way to actually add contacts to it. It's going to show up with your preset numbers that are typically pulled from AD, but that you can manage. Um, but it searches the directory extremely fast. I, I haven't seen it show up yet with any of my favorites or anything like that. Um, and I haven't found a list to populate it. Okay. Okay. I pretty much got through everything with the user interface that's changed. Has anybody played with this? Do you have questions? Have you, is there things you've found that, that you really like about this? That you, anybody out there that you want to talk about now? Or any pain points you had with previous clients you want to see how it's done in this one? Sure. Um, yeah, we, we were able to do that pop out in, in uh, 2013. Um, <clears throat> but what I have noticed in the, the meeting, the video session in the Skype user interface is that you get a lot more widescreen options. So if I switch this here to gallery view, my mouse is not cooperating, gallery view. So I could pop, what Lyle's talking about is we can pop this out and then you can move this over to a different screen if you have two monitors. So you can have video on one screen. <clears throat> so that's been there for quite a while. Um, also, the, the video uh, sessions typically are squares. If you're using a higher end camera, it will actually default this to be widescreen. So there's a Logitech makes a conference cam uh, 3000, which is a, a very nice USB pan tilt zoom camera. There are others on the market. That's, that's an example. That will actually prefer widescreen over the square, even in the the meeting experience because it's sending a 1080p camera. Okay. All right. So with that, if there are any other questions about the client, let's talk about them now. But <clears throat> that was the conclusion of the demo of the user interface. This is where I had broken in or worked in at a, at a formal break for you guys to go grab some more coffee because I figured at this point, eyes would be heavy. We'd want to get some legs stretched, get the blood flowing again so that you can come back and you can listen to me talk some more.